Um, I said that I would bring something this week to, um, to back up what I was saying last Friday. Um, if you remember about shift, the shifting priorities and um, Um, not that 
it's all about numbers, but it's just interesting to me. Um, anyway, we have enough struggle with being as big as we are. <laughs> I imagine 2,000, but anyway. <laughs> so, what he's saying was that the church is shifting priorities, needs to shift priorities. And see if you can recognize us, those of you who've been with us for more than five years, even, even two years. Um, so that you can, by doing this, I'm hoping that it brings some understanding and some peace to how weird we felt for the last 12 months. Okay? Um, because it seemed like we, well, we had to die to our public profile. So we just had to die to something in order to lay hold of the next thing. Except that there's been a, um, you know, a pause for 12 months and so who are we, you know? And, um, and so funny, this morning I woke up, God's always talking to me when I wake up. Not that that happens every morning, but when he speaks to me significantly, it's always when I'm waking up. So, how many of you have seen that kids' movie, Toy Story? You have to watch it if you haven't seen it. Toy Story. I can get many pictures out of anything. And um, in Toy Story, there's, it's all about these toys that speak and they're like made to be, you know, actual living beings, but they're still toys. All got personalities. There's a really cruel kid in Toy Story that dismantles all these beautiful toys and puts them back together like monsters. I mean, they're just grotesque. He's got like Barbie's head on the body of a goose, some sort of awful thing and claws. Anybody remember that scene? And, and a lot of them, you're winding up, they're walking across the floor and they're just grotesque. So I wake up this morning and I see that. And I'm thinking about us. <laughs> and and the Lord said, I promise you it's not gonna look like that. <laughs> when, when I reconstruct you. <laughs> because your parts need to be in the right place and they need to fit me. But at the moment it's felt like everything's everywhere for the last time. But God is a master perhaps he knows what he's doing. So here we go. Point number one that the most powerful um, Christian influences in the world are saying at the moment is that we need to just deconstruct worship that sings. Deconstruct worship that sings, that is the song service. And we always know what song service is. Mm -hmm. Lyrics, half of the songs, half an hour exactly. <laughs> I've gone that long with this for years. We deconstruct worship that sings to reconstruct worship that hosts his presence. Yeah? So they're saying, this is what it needs to be like. Um, <coughs> so consider us for the last few years. Um, worship that sings is what they call stage influenced. It's all coming from the stage. That needs to shift to congregational influence. So, this is what they're saying. How true? Yeah. Congregational influence. Um, no more of the stand up, sit down, clap three times, raise your say to neighbor, you know. What do you mean? <laughs> whatever. Um, it's in the congregation that have got stuff to contribute. So stage influence to congregational influence. It needs to, it needs to come out of being a musical event, which you can easily come and watch the worship. And the more exciting a band you have, the more state of the art everything you have, and I'm not against all that. But it's a musical event. It's like going to a concert. You don't have to worship. You just assume the position, which 
means you could be thinking about your shopping list or, you know, the young guy in front of you is looking for a husband. You know, you don't have to be, you know. This movement needs to change to parts for intimacy. So this is how nobody's coming to watch and God's coming to worship. They want to be intimate with the Lord, so they're coming to have an intimate encounter. Amen? It needs to go from being rehearsal orientated, which means um, it's all rehearsed. There's three verses, two choruses, it ends, you sing that last line three times, whatever. Rehearsal oriented to an expectation of being spirit led. Which means you might stay on one song for an hour and a half. Um, I'm asking you to reflect back on us. <laughs> you get past half a song at time. Expectation for spirit led. The next point is that any spaces in, in the worship, any spaces in the worship were filled by the worship team. Only the ones up here would maybe take a little bit of something or sing a little bit of something. That needs to change to space that invites the congregation in. Does anybody have a song? Does anybody have a word? This is great. I mean, it is supposed to be like this. <clears throat> then um, it needs to go from worship that sings will congratulate the worship team. That's all right, we understood it before. I said, thanks guys, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But you go beyond that to if the, if the congregation had participated, you congratulate the congregation. To yeah. so, thanks guys for finding the courage to get up. So can you see that we've been there for all these years? So I'm encouraged by that. And I'm glad that more churches are realizing that this is the presence of God. We need to have worship that comes the presence of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the second big point, we need to deconstruct. <coughs> deconstruct making disciples of the church to reconstruct making disciples of the Jesus. Because the church has preached the church for far too long. So, in a church that makes disciples of the church, or that church, it will, the primary vision will be the vision of the leaders. So you'll be told, this is my vision, you need to all fit in it. Or get lost, basically. <laughs> you know, you need to all, where can I put you in my vision? That needs to go from that to the congregation following their dream. That means that the leaders have to find out from the individual members of the congregation what their vision and dream is and help them come into that. Amen? Amen. But where do you see that? So, that needs to happen more. So, making disciples of the church means people are recruited to programs. Which is what I just said. Come in, where can we fit you? Or you'd be good in the men's ministry, you'd be good with the kids, you'd be good in this, you'd be good in that. Um, I'll put you into what already exists.
no wickedness, the widow of salvation that gets us. It's basically encouraging people to comply with the church program, or you might not get in. Anyway, these are some of the things that you do when churches are making a disciple of the church. Number one, attend church. So, to be honest, I've never run after anybody who can speak to people that are members of what I'm here today. That would be for a while. Some have left, but many have not left. They're just not coming. But I'm not the kind of leader that gets all paranoid and runs after them. There's nothing worse than putting that sort of a guilt trip on people. If they wanted to be there, they would be. They've probably got reasons why they're not. But together, I'm not going to run after it. So anyway, these are some of the things you're expected. Attend church, tithe, belong to a small group, and serve in the church. Now, those things in themselves are all good. But it keeps everyone in the building. It keeps everyone church focused. So what, what we need to shift is from behavior that gets me to heaven to beliefs that release heaven on earth through me. Yeah? yeah. That means that people need to become self-governing. Without going to hold and preach, I've discovered after over 35 years of dealing with people that many of them actually prefer a rule <laughs> rather than take responsibility for their own behavior. But if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, we need to be self-governing, we need to have personal responsibility, we need to be self-aware, we don't need to have people telling us all the time. Yeah? We realize we are innately powerful. No matter where we are. You don't have to have somebody who has a zap on the hand. You know, you don't have an anointing, you don't have to be so powerful. No, it's in us. The sons of Jesus know that he is in there by his spirit and he wants to get out and continue this work. Disciples of Jesus are inherently supernatural. They know they're supernatural beings. And that shows up in our identity. You know it's the supernatural. I'm a supernatural woman. Because of him. <laughs> and um, uh, intimacy is important. We want to be intimate with him. We know we have an inheritance, and we know we're called to influence. So we don't have to be whipped up about, whipped up to know all this. We, should, we know it. These are disciples of Jesus, rather than disciples of the church. The disciples of the church are all about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The disciples of Jesus are all about the tree of life. Yeah? So far, so good. So this is what it, we're supposed to look like at this stage of the prophetic timetable. The next major area to deconstruct is we deconstruct functional relationships and we reconstruct heart relationships. So we change from that one to that one. You know, how many know that even just from working in the workplace, you can work with somebody at the telemarketing organization or wherever you work, but you would never invite them to dinner. You don't want them for dinner, but you can work with them because you don't know what your job description is. So there's a lot of that going on in the church. Working with people you don't necessarily like, but God's looking for our heart. Jesus said, this disciple will be known by what? And love for one another. So this area is not negotiable. And uh, you've heard me say so many times, personal relationships can be very difficult for prophetic people. 
Because we don't easily trust, because we can see one another. I know what you're thinking, no matter what your false teeth are showing. <laughs> it's not easy, it's been the challenge of our life, I tell you. Anyway, so, in functional relationships in the church, influence is based on your place in the structure. Where are you on the ladder of influence in the church? Okay? That's where your influence is based. But in heart relationships, everybody is equally powerful and their voice matters in discussion and in discovery. So everyone gets to be heard. In the functional relationships, people are expected to perform for recognition and results. That's a bit like conditional love. If you behave well, I'll love you, you'll be a good girl, you know, you might get a company car, whatever. <laughs> um, but you've got to perform. Whereas in heart relationships, value is found in acceptance and the outcomes are reviewed on the basis of various goals. Sometimes God will, will ask someone to do something and he knows it's going to fail. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. It just means the thing he's asking to do may fail, but it may work for a bigger purpose. Amen? So, what, you know, and I'll, some of you have heard me say before about the guy called John Wimper who's acknowledged as one of the great, he's dead now, but one of the great fathers of the faith. He was always doing stuff, and he'd start something, and God would say to him, once he got the foundation, and God would say, actually, I'm not doing that anymore. He'd be like, what? I thought he told me that we're not doing that anymore. He lied, because I'm not interested in that anymore. But if I'm just looking at you before. 
performance all the time, there's something wrong with that. So, deconstructing functional relationships. In the church, you develop a, yeah, a community that serves, but the roles are all filled, you know, they're all filled. You know, some people can stay in positions for years and years and years. They've got that job and nobody else is having it, you know. <laughs> and God, they want to move them out and put somebody else in there, move them into something else. That needs to come beyond that into a community that is inclusive and draws others in. So everybody gets to come in and be a part, a part of it all, but as who they are. Amen. So that one's a bit tricky to get your head around, but functional relationships need to be reconstructed into heart relationships so that we work together from a place of loving one another and honoring one another rather than just because we have to. I don't know why he's on his team, I can't stand him. I don't know why I have she got that job, but I've got to work with him. I don't like my youth leader, but I guess I'm stuck with him, you know, all that sort of stuff. We need to really, and God has been strict with us at four hours over the years with getting to know one another, showing hospitality to one another, trusting, risking our heart with one another. So I think we've done pretty good most of the time. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I'm looking at myself as well. The last point, we need to just deconstruct, some long words here, deconstruct denominational imperatives around theology and praxis. Has anybody heard that word before? It's a new word, praxis. I thought it was a spelling mistake at first, but I looked at the dictionary, P-R-A-X-I-S, and it, it means established customs or accepted customs. So it's almost a tradition, but accepted practices and customs. So we need to deconstruct denominational, you know, um, there's some massive denominations out there and, and they've got a value system and um, they've usually got it written into, you know, um, somewhere we all have to do this or we'll be like this is or how we do things. Um, and we need to reconstruct that around fathers and friends. Fathers and friends. So, this takes us from, and we know the whole area of covering, covering and structural accountability. That whole thing can go way too far. Covering and accountability shifts over now to a father's natural commitment, like parental leaders. Parental, fathers and mothers, hello, I should write that in there. Um, <laughs> fathers' natural commitment, influence, and given trust. This is a much more vulnerable place, actually. But it's what God's looking for. The highest in the church, the highest governing authority, is a denominational structure. So it's how we talk about it now, naming a denomination, but I, I was in the Assemblies of God for 18 years. And there were just things that were just not going to change. It was, this is how we do it here, that's it, there's no argument. And it's universal, it's the same thing. Even though they were claim to have autonomy, it's just not AOG. Um, anyway. So there was pressure brought to bear to perform. Um, but in the um, fathers and friends dynamic, the highest governing authority are the local elders. So in the denominations, you can have your rule from the top. Yeah? Your rule from the top. 
But in this new way, that like, I mean, you've heard me say this, if we went to a church up the road and went there to preach, I would say to you, when we come in here, the highest authority in this place is not me, it's the elders here. Whoever the leader is of this place, we are submitting to them. Amen? So, In the church, the oversight is based on leaders and followers. So you've got this gap. You've got the leaders and the followers. And there's a great divide in between. But in the thing that God's wanting, you've got oversight that is orientated towards family and friends and family. So there's not such a distance between us. Amen? So, also in the church, if you are church-minded and you belong to a denomination, then the pressure is on to build the denomination. You build the denomination, that's all there is. In the other thing, when we shift priority now, we are, this is the last minute, we are, we are geared to establish apostolic cities and regions. So it's not so much about building a denomination. We're not building a foreigner's denomination. We want to build the Gold Coast. We want to build the region. We want to build Australia. We want to build outside of the four walls. Amen? So basically what he's saying is that the priorities in the, how we do church, how we see Christianity, have to shift. Because Jesus preached the kingdom. He never preached church. Now the church is the instrument that will bring the kingdom. But we've, we've got blocked at the point of where we built our church. And then when the churches don't want to work together or do anything together or cooperate, unity is not possible. No matter how much we talk about it or pray about it, until we're willing to realize there's one church in a region, you know, Paul wrote to regions, not just individual churches, but so many churches in lockdown being owned. And so this is what has to shift. So it's, I said I'd read all that to you because the right hand column of where, how it's meant to be, I believe we've been living there for the last 16 years. Which I'm not trying to be smart, but it's like, okay, Lord, thank you. See, we've been in prophetic dynamic. Um, we got accused and insulted and misunderstood and called every name under the sun. I don't have a persecution complex, I really don't. But because other people do, we've got to think about this. But my thing is, as long as it's catching on, <laughs> we've done a good job. Because we are, a name like foreigners, we must break through. We bring, we bulldoze and we bring breakthrough and we put foundations in. And it's interesting, once it all catches on, all the colourful people come in and get the credit for it. <laughs> and the ones who did all the hard yakka, <laughs> Oh, I've forgotten. It's just the nature of pioneering. It's like, you know, and we don't need credit for it, but I'm, I'm just, I think it'll make sense to us in the next season we're going into. And what, and how I see it is that we established a prophetic dynamic. In the, in the, um, the atmosphere, in the ether, you know, in our meetings, um, I think that we came, we became really, really prophetic, and we got a handle on it. That doesn't mean that we're finished with it, but it means we now are prophetic enough to be trusted in the apostolic. Because the true apostolic is not going to happen without the prophetic. So, I just want to take a few minutes.
So I've got 10 minutes left. I promise to be short today. <laughs> um, just want to give you 10 signs. 10 signs of an apostolic people. Does that excite you? 10 signs. See if this is you. An apostolic people and church. Now this is where we're at now. We've got to get this right. I believe we will. If we can come through the year that we've had, I think we can get this right. The number one sign of an apostolic people, an apostolic church, is they are focused. <laughs> they are focused. Absolutely. They must be focused so that people can follow. If we're not focused, who's going to follow? I don't know where we're going. Which is why I'm saying all this. You wouldn't get on a bus that had no destination on the front of it, would you? You wouldn't know where it was going to take you. So we are all about all things kingdom. I know kingdom's not a new word. I know everyone's talking about kingdom, kingdom focus, but we've got to do it. So you can't just say you are kingdom just because it's the latest trend if you're not really kingdom. Because being kingdom requires some things. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, you, know, you can read these scriptures later if I give you a couple of scriptures. But Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, pressing forward, you know, and it was all about the upward call of God. It's like, okay, everything you've done so far, that's been great. Nothing's wasted. God's not going to waste any of it. But we're not back there now. We're going here. And we are laying hold of something. And we are laying hold of the thing that he called us for. So we're pressing on. And that requires extreme focus. So number two. Sign of an apostolic people. They are positive. Show me your face. <laughs> We've had a, we're in the middle of a year where we are told to overcome negativity and develop in hope. And we're about halfway through it and the negativity has been just gruesome. It's been woeful. Negativity. Neg you know, negativity is the same word in the Hebrew as unbelief. Mm. And it's why the Israelites <coughs> went around in the desert for all those years. Unbelief. And um, so, how do you become positive? You know, positive people are overcomers who refuse, refuse and resist negativity. And um, I sent you a letter recently, I was here, I sent you a letter called Whatever. <laughs> and uh, from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, we are told, you know, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is, I can't remember who it is, but it's all the good stuff. And it says, fix your mind on these things. If you fix your mind on those things, it's difficult to be negative. And if you're really negative, go and find someone who's a Barnabas. They'll drive you mad, but go and find them. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to keep turning around until it becomes a positive. So, focused, positive, is this you yet? Number three, attractive. Episodic people are very attractive. Why are they attractive? Because they have favor with God. People who have favor are very attractive. What does attractive mean? It means someone who, if you look at an attractive person, you usually look more than once. Because they get your attention. Even the natural someone who's attractive will get someone who's nicely dressed, someone who's, you know, 
whatever, in the, in the natural. But the scripture says that without faith it is impossible to please God. So people who are attractive, they have favour, and uh, nothing attracts God's favour more than our faith. Yeah? So we've got to come out of negativity. Into positivity and faith and hope we were told to develop in hope. Because that attracts God's favour. We're supposed to make people jealous, guys. What is it about her? Well, she's got the favour of God, clearly. Let's look at all this stuff that keeps happening. Just keeps happening. Why is it always her? Well, maybe there's some faith in God. <laughs> God rewards faith. Mm-hmm. And he's pleased with faith. So we need to keep throwing some please bombs at him, you know, please. <laughs> Just become attractive. So apostolic people are attractive, but it doesn't have to be physical. They're attractive spiritually. Mm-hmm. Number four, apostolic people and churches are relational. Relational in their attitude, not denominational. This whole denominational thing needs to get blown up. Yes. 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 So it needs to be relational across the board, realizing that God loves everyone who names the name of Jesus and, and lives for him. Amen? So that means relational will take us outside of our own environment and we will look out for one another's interests. Relational people will want unity. They will want to be involved with the church at large. That's apostolic. That's about region. That's about territory. That's about taking cities. Number five. And so that people are vibrant. Now there's the word. Mm-hmm. Look at you. <laughs> vibrant. Are you vibrant? Am I vibrant today? <laughs> how do you get vibrant? And how do you just get vibrant if you don't, if you don't feel vibrant? <laughs> well, Psalm 119 and verse 113. That's really a great psalm. Is that really a long psalm that goes on forever? That's got a whole bunch of people writing different bits. Um, anyway, um, that verse says, The entrance of your word brings light. The vibrant is about being very bright, full of light and bright, full of the word of God. So, a vibrant church. Is one that which loves and receives the word of God. Yeah. It's like, oh no, I don't know the preach. Oh, I'm not in preaching again, is it? <laughs> you know, just loving the word of God. It's one of the reasons that we've now got a Bible college. Deliberately so that people can learn the word of God. Because the entrance of his word brings light. And I want to be vibrant. And I don't want to have to just put on a colour to be vibrant. You know, the day that I can wear all beige and still look vibrant, I think I'll have something right. <laughs> vibrant. But well, think about that, because this is us. We need to be vibrant. So that people go, who are they? What's going on? What are they on? <laughs> have some of that. Um, there's a great scripture in Acts chapter 4. This is point 6. Um, an apostolic church is reverent. Um, they would fear God. They fear God rather than people. In Acts chapter 4, it's all about where they were basically, they were, the disciples were being told to shut up. They were being commanded to, to not ever say the name of Jesus again. They were being told not to preach go away, and you know, the authorities were cracking down heavy on them. And they said, please pray for us for boldness, because should we fear men, or obey God, (coughs) or we fear God. Well, the day is coming, just watch the news every night, pretty soon you'll be forbidden to speak the name of Jesus. But 
that happened in Australia, it's going to happen. Well, why are we going to shut up? I don't think so. Might need to be wise. May need to make sure we're barking up the right tree, not the wrong tree, before we open up our mouth. But we still need to speak boldly by this time. So reverent, revering God above all other things. That's in Acts chapter 4. Number 7. And beside the church is unselfish in every area. Actually, the whole of Acts chapter 4 covers several of these points. Um, in verse 32, it talks about the other church, how they had all things in common. Nobody said that anything was theirs. You know, common property, if somebody needed something. You know, they were unselfish. Preferring others, thinking about others all the time. All things in common. Um, <laughs> Which means, you know, uh, hospitality needs to come into a whole other yeah. level. Because you will let you into my house. Will you let me into your house? You know. Um, will, you, will you let me see your stuff? <laughs> oh my gosh. I had an auntie Maud. Auntie Maud. A genius of making custard pies um, in the north of England when I was a kid. She, every Sunday she made custard pies, but no one was going to church. Really. She made custard pies and she made them for the whole street. She didn't eat them, she didn't like them. It was something she would do. So the whole street would pour into her house at some stage and take however many custard pies they wanted. But uh, having said that, if you admired her goodness, you'd get those as well. If you said you liked her kind of goodness, you'd get that. If this woman could not stop giving, she didn't know Jesus, but she had something a bit better than most of us. <laughs> she had everything. Okay, number eight, then we're done. An apostolic church is also is prophetic and supernatural. That means moving in the gifts. That means that there's training and opportunity given to move in the gifts, opportunity to be supernatural. The yeah, apostles are characterized by signs, wonders, miracles. You know, and um, the, the days are gone where we can just keep waiting for who's going to go first. You know, it's got to get supernatural. Can you just do it? Well, the minute you believe, the minute you believe you can, there's an opportunity there, you just do it. And the reason we can is point nine, because we are anointed for signs, wonders, and miracles. Apostolic, there's an anointing of the victor in an apostolic church. There's the Great Commission as a lifestyle in the marketplace, wherever you go. Anointed for signs, wonders, and miracles. Take it to your workplace. Take it wherever you go. You know it's inside you. We have an anointing. It abides. We draw on it. And we carry on Jesus' work. Amen? And the last point. An apostolic church and an apostolic people, we are bold and progressive. <laughs> bold. <laughs> bold, let me say it again. And progressive, uh, carry, we shake and take cities. I've had three people say to me in the last few weeks, I feel quite shaken by our conversation. <coughs> it's the word they use, I'm shaken. I don't know what to do now. You said something that's dislodged all this stuff in my life, and I'm shaken by it. What they meant was in a good way. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, that's great. You know. So um we might have a board of all like chess pieces that are just glued down, you know, you can't move anything. God is shaking. Shaking cities is shaking people. So shaking and taking cities. And again, in Acts chapter four, where they say, pray for us that we might have boldness.
Like the sight people don't back down. We're not backing down. And so in my book, a funny shape at the moment. God is changing our shape. He promised we won't look like the monsters in Toy Story. <laughs> we'll look good, we'll have all the right pieces, we'll be like brand new, we'll be strong, we'll be focused, we'll be all these things in the list. So that that's not I so feel tempted to say turn your name, G name was won't you, G. But basically that's us, and it's the person next to us, and it's the person behind us. It's all of us. It's not me. Just me. Amen. So with the prophetic, the prophetic ministry can be quite introvert because we're sensitive. Amen. Yeah. 